As anyone who has ever experienced it can tell you, war is a nasty business, and whoever tells you otherwise either hasn't experienced it firsthand or profits from war in one way or the other. In any case, the tides of war are almost never certain, and things can turn around at a moment's notice. With this in mind, we'll be taking a look at some of the most ingenious and mind-blowing tricks used during war. Number 10. The Dutch Floating Island On February 27, 1942, a mixed force of American, British, Dutch, and Australian Navy suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the Japanese in what later became known as the Battle of the Java Sea. In the aftermath, the Dutch lost complete control over the East Indies, and over the following days, Japanese bombers scoured the seas in search for the retreating Allied forces. One of those stranded ships was the Dutch HNMLS Abraham Crinson, a poorly defended and slow-moving minesweeper. The only chance for survival was to reach Australia. But because of the Japanese superiority and unrelenting air surveillance, this was next to impossible. The solution was amazing and ingenious to say the least. The 45-man crew anchored the ship near one of the many islands in Indonesia and then went on land, cutting down as many trees as they could fit on the small minesweeper. Then they arranged them to look like a densely packed piece of jungle. What couldn't be hidden away by the canopy was painted to look like cliffs, but as you can imagine, this was not enough to hide from the Japanese planes flying overhead, especially if the ship was moving in the middle of the sea. So to combat this, they stayed put close to the shore and waited for nightfall to come. Once under the cover of darkness, they would leave for another island island close by, inching their way closer and closer to Australia with each passing day. The whole ordeal lasted for eight days, after which the Dutch minesweeper managed to reach Australia and reunite with the other Allied forces there. Number 9. The Fake Trees of World War One. Of all the wars that have ever gripped the planet and pitted people against each other, none were more horrendous than World War One. With new technologies like tanks, barbed wire, advanced artillery, and chemical weapons, the endless battlefield lines became hell on earth for those involved. It was a horrible war of attrition with trenches and barbed wire and an extensive no man's land running between the two opposing trench systems. In some cases, this no man's land was so wide that it was impossible for one side to see what the other side were doing. So, in order to get a better vantage point, the French were the first to make use of what little else remained on the battlefield and which was inconspicuous enough not to draw that much attention. This was exploded tree stumps. They would pick one relatively close to the enemy lines, and then they would carry out an extensive operation of photographing, measuring, and sketching it. All of this, of course, was done in secret and from some distance. Then, all of this data was taken to a workshop in order to fabricate a perfect replica. It would have the same exact dimensions, splinters, and imperfections, almost down to the tiniest detail. These faux trees were, of course, made out of metal, and they were hollow inside with a tiny ladder that would extend almost to the top. There was also a small retractable chair and a few cleverly concealed holes through which a soldier could spy on the enemy's movements. The hardest part came when they wanted to replace the original tree with the fake one. So under the cover of darkness and extensive machine gun and artillery fire, as well as other diversions, a team of engineers would take the fake tree to the location in no man's land, uproot the original one, and then plant the new observation tree in its place. If all went well and the enemy was none the wiser about the exchange, then a soldier, usually one of smaller stature, would sneak into it at night and spy on the enemy. He would then bring this information back to HQ each night. Although this wasn't a comfortable position, both sides used surveillance trees during the war. Number 8. The Romans were once afraid of trees. While on the subject of trees cleverly used during war, we'll take a look back at the ancient times. More precisely, in 88 AD, in an engagement between the Romans and the Dacians in what is now southwest Romania. One year prior, the Roman Emperor Domitian ordered his general Cornelius Fuscus to attack the Dacians with five of his legions. But they would have it that on their way to Samogeta Chusa, the kingdom's capital located high up in the mountains, the Roman legions were ambushed by the Dacians under King Decebalus. Here, in the narrow pass of Tape, the legions were decimated and General Fuscus was killed. The Dacians then took the Roman equipment as spoils of war. In the summer of 88 AD, Domitian sent another force led by another general, Tetius Julianus, on the same route as last time in an attempt to take the capital city and subdue the Dacians once and for all. This time, however, the Romans were victorious and the Dacian forces were decimated, even though the Romans themselves suffered heavy losses. 
What happened next is related by Cassius Dio, a Roman historian. Fearing that the Romans would reach and conquer Samogetusa, King Decebalius ordered a patch of forest to be cut down ahead of the advancing Romans. Then the human-sized tree trunks would be dressed in armor. Seeing this from afar, Tetius Julianus, now with his own forces severely weakened and believing that Decebalus received reinforcements, he decided to withdraw. In a fortunate turn of events for the Dacians, a pretender to the Roman throne rebelled against Domitian at this time, and so did some Germanic tribes. These led the emperor to conclude a truce with Decebalus by offering the Dacians an annual subsidy, as well as some Roman construction engineers, in exchange for Dacia becoming a vassal state. Some historians go so far as to say that this unfavorable deal for Rome ultimately led to Domitian's assassination in 92 AD. Number 7. Bluffing for Belgrade Bluffing is a skill usually used in games of poker, but as it turns out, you can conquer entire cities with it. This was the case of Fritz Klingenberg, a German captain during World War II who was described by his superiors as being intelligent yet headstrong, loyal yet not above correcting his superiors, brilliant under pressure yet arrogant to the point of insubordination. During the early years of the war, when Germany was in full expansion mode, Klingenberg was leading a motorcycle reconnaissance unit tasked with gathering information ahead of the army. Upon nearing the Yugoslavian city of Belgrade, the 26-year-old captain decided to cross the Danube River with six of his men and survey it more closely. The city went through a four-day period of Nazi aerial bombardment, and most of the Serbian officials had fled by that time. They hijacked several vehicles, rescued a drunken German tourist who was set to be executed, and entered Belgrade without any real opposition. He then replaced the Yugoslavian flag with the Nazi colors on several of the buildings, and ordered his men to patrol the city in their vehicles, thus giving the impression that Belgrade was now in German hands. When confronted by the mayor and several other officials that remained behind, Klingenberg told them that he was in charge of the point team leading several SS tank divisions and that Belgrade was now under Nazi control. He also told the mayor that he needed to get in contact with his unit via radio, otherwise the German Air Force would continue to bombard the city, quickly followed by a strong ground artillery attack. Not sure what to make of it, the mayor was pondering Klingenberg's words with a dose of skepticism. But as he was doing so, a group of German reconnaissance planes flew above, and the captain pointed up while tapping his wrist. This reminded the mayor that his time was running out. The mayor then immediately relented and began preparations for surrender. Even the Nazi forces receiving Klingenberg's radio transmission didn't believe him at first, thinking that he was somehow captured, tortured, and forced to lure the German army into an ambush. He nevertheless was able to capture 1,300 Serbian troops and 200,000 civilians with only a handful of men, quick wit, and without firing a single shot. Number 6. Zhu Jiang, the original sleeping dragon. A somewhat similar story took place in 3rd century China, but in reverse, where an overwhelming force was driven away by a single man with a loot. But this was no ordinary man, it was none other than the great general Zhu sleeping dragon Liang. In what was one of the few mistakes of his entire career, Liang found himself at one time stranded from the bulk of his forces with well over 100,000 enemy soldiers bearing down on him and with no chance of retreat. Any other general might have accepted defeat and surrendered, or at the worst committed suicide in order to avoid embarrassment. But not Liang. Hearing about the large army headed towards them, Liang ordered the roughly 100 men under his command at the time to open the gates of the town where they were located, and then he told them to hide. He then changed into simple Taoist robes, climbed into the most visible part of the wall, and waited. When the huge army arrived, led by Sima Yi, a longtime enemy of Liang's, he immediately knew that something was wrong. Knowing full well what the sleeping dragon was capable of, Sima Yi suspected a trap. The fact that Liang was burning incense and playing his loot while the overwhelming army was just beneath his feet didn't help in the decision-making on Sima Yi's part. He concluded that Liang had laid an elaborate trap for them, and he ordered a swift retreat. In today's China, the sleeping dragon is regarded among the most popular statesmen and skilled military commanders in the country's history. Number 5. That time the Soviets tricked the Nazis into supplying them on a regular basis. What came to be known as Operation Scherhorn was actually a clever ploy on the Soviets' part by convincing the Nazi high command in Berlin to send in regular supplies for almost a year between August 1944 and May 1945. The operation was proposed by none other than Stalin himself and implemented by the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, the NKVD. The Soviets somehow managed to convince the Nazis that a force of 2,500 German soldiers was trapped behind enemy lines in what is now present-day Belarus. 
Jews. With the help of German Lieutenant Colonel Heinrich Scherhorn, who was a prisoner of war and coerced into taking part in the ruse, the Soviets put their plans into action. Scherhorn made contact with Berlin, told them of the situation and location, and requested assistance. Though initially believing it to be a trap, the Nazis eventually agreed and sent in a small group of commandos to rescue them. But as fate would have it, they were captured. Several other attempts were made, but every time Russian forces appeared as if out of nowhere and stopped the rescue operation. The German commands then decided against any further rescue attempts and instead opted for airdropping supplies at regular intervals. Otto Skorzeny was in charge of keeping Scherhorn supplied. What's really interesting here is the fact that even when the Nazis were at the end of their rope with the Allied forces attacking them on all fronts, they still continued sending in supplies to Scherhorn and his men. Not only that, but for his valor and resilience in the face of adversity, Scherhorn was regarded as a national hero and even awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, the highest award in the German military during World War II. Number 4. Animals in World War I As we mentioned in a previous entry, World War I was the most horrible conflict the world had ever seen. It was the first major conflict to bring a lot of innovation onto the battlefield, and with it, improvisation was a must. So besides those fake trees used as vantage spots in No Man's Land that we talked about before, in order to spy on the enemy, there were also cases of paper mache horse carcasses that blended in perfectly among the other countless dead horses scattered everywhere. From inside these hollowed out fake horses, soldiers could spy on the enemy and report their movements back to base. Also, if there was the case of an artillery bombardment or something similar, they would use the confusion and chaos to snipe at the enemy. On the African front, however, there were also cases of ponies painted as zebras so as to not draw attention of the enemy and raise their suspicion. When it came to sea warfare, soldiers really became inventive. For starters, they thought that by training sea lions to associate any submarines with feeding time, they would start flocking around one every time it was near and thus reveal its presence. This technique didn't prove too useful because, as it turns out, it's quite hard to keep track of all the sea lions swimming freely off the coasts of Great Britain. The idea even went as far as painting the sea lions with glow-in-the-dark paint so that submarines can be spotted even at night. It's a cool idea, but it didn't work. And neither did the technique of training seagulls to poop on enemy submarine periscopes. Yep, totally a real operation as well. Number 3. The Mysterious Q-Ships of World War I Sea warfare during World War I also changed beyond recognition, especially with the introduction of the submarine. The German U-boats were notorious and became a serious threat, especially for the Allied merchant fleet carrying supplies from America, Canada, or the British Empire to the United Kingdom. So, in order to counteract this hidden threat, the British came up with the Q-ships, or decoy vessels. These ships were usually smaller in size, and with good reason. German submarines usually relied on surface gunfire to destroy the small smaller vessels, preferring to preserve their torpedoes for larger military ships. While underwater, U-boats were almost undefeatable, but on the surface they suddenly became more vulnerable. This is why the British believed that with enough concealed armament on a Q-ship, the battle could turn to their favor. But in order for this ruse to work, the sailors and the ships themselves needed to play the part of actual merchant ships. They adopted elaborate disguises for both the vessel and the crew, and the ships changed their names almost every time they went out to sea. Some of the sailors would even cross-dress and put on plays for the spying German submarines, acting as if they were on a cruise or something. And when they saw the U-boat, half of the crew would pretend to be panicking and go for the life rafts, while the other crew would man the concealed weaponry. Once the U-boats were in range, they would begin firing and sometimes even destroy them. This technique proved quite successful, at least in its early days. However, after a while, the Germans realized what was going on and changed their strategy. Number 2. Operation Spring of Youth in the aftermath of the Munich massacre in 1972, where 11 Israeli Olympic athletes were taken hostage and then later killed by a Palestinian terrorist group known as Black September, the IDF, Israel Defense Force, organized a counterattack one year later where three high-ranking Palestine Liberation Organization PLO leaders were to be executed. The operation was known as Spring of Youth. The targets were located in Beirut and Lebanon, and to get there, the commandos were sent via powerboats to the coast. From there, Mossad took them to the location where the targets were living. But in order to get close to the apartment buildings, the Israeli commandos needed to draw little to no attention from the local police and PLO soldiers that were around. So, in order to get close, half of the Israeli commandos dressed up as women and walked hand in hand with their male counterparts posing as lovers. The scheme worked, and they managed to get past the guards and were successful in eliminating their targets. In charge of the operation, and one of the commandos dressed as a woman, was Ehud Barak, Israel's former prime minister, as well as Minister of Defense. 
And we know what you're probably thinking now, and no, Steven Spielberg's film Munich is not based on this operation. It is, however, referenced in the film, as is Barrack. Number 1. Opium-Laced Cigarettes in 1917, during the Sinai and Palestine campaign of World War I, the British were fighting the Ottoman Empire over the region and the conquest of Jerusalem. Over the course of several months, as the Ottomans were being constantly bombarded, they began to become isolated and their supplies ran short. The British were dropping packs of cigarettes alongside propaganda materials as a means of deterring the Turks from fighting. It didn't work, but the Turks did get used to looking for cigarettes on the battlefield. So, before the British led the attack on the town of Beersheba, they sent another airdrop of cigarettes to the Ottomans, but this time the cigarettes were laced with high quantities of opium. These cigarettes rendered the Turkish forces immobile, and the battle was won by the British. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you're looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out one of my other channels? Today I found out. Link to that on the screen now, as well as a video from that channel. And give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, and subscribe to this channel. Brand new videos every day of the week. And as always, thank you for watching.